Welcome to the ninth webinar of the wider webinar series, How is COVID-19 Changing Development? The wider webinar series features a lineup of eminent researchers and development specialists who present new research on the implications they foresee of COVID-19 for global development efforts and the economic, political, and social impacts for the global South. The title of today's webinar is International Trade and Supply Chains, What Can We Tell About the Recovery Post-COVID-19? The growth of international trade and expansion of global value chains over the last 30 years has been quite remarkable and the effects on development is very clear to see. Incomes have risen, productivity has gone up and poverty has fallen. The fragmentation of production and knowledge transfer inherent in global value chains are in no small part responsible for these advances. At this moment, however, there is reason to worry that this trade-led path to development is under threat. Since 2008, after the global financial crisis, trade and global value chain growth have languished. COVID-19 has brought further concerns. Many governments now worry about the robustness and resilience of global value chains. This webinar will discuss emerging evidence on new patterns in international trade and global value chains, current policy changes, uh, challenges in light of the, of the pandemic and implications for development. We have two distinguished economists to speak on this topic. Firstly, we have Daria Taglioni, who's research manager, trade international integration, head of a research group at the World Bank, where she's held various positions and roles, including team task lead for the World European Report 2020, principal economist in the International Finance Corporation, and the World Bank's global lead on global value chains. Daria will be drawing for the World European Report 2020 in her presentation. We also have a discussant Professor Selim Brahan. Selim Brahan is a professor at the Department of Economics, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and the executive director of the South Asia Network on Economic Modeling, Sanem in short. He's an honorary senior research fellow at the University of Manchester. Selim is one of South Asia's leading trade economists, and he'll be speaking about, in particular, the implications of the pandemic on trade and value chains with a focus on South Asia. Now, a few logistical issues. First, you must type in your questions using the Q&A feature that you see on your screen. I will read out the questions on your behalf. Second, the webinar will be recorded and shared later on our YouTube channel afterwards. I would like to invite Daria to speak for probably around 20, 20 minutes. Daria, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Kunal. Um, and thanks for inviting me, uh, hopefully next time in Helsinki. So, um, as Kunal said, I will be um, drawing from uh, the report on the, the World Development Report on Global Value Chains. And there is an important reason for this, is that the economics behind what's happening doesn't need to be revisited. The models work and uh, somehow what we are experiencing is in line with what economic uh, models and empirics uh, tell us. And so I want to, to start with the world we have left. And it is a world where uh, trade and global value chains blossomed within a relatively liberal environment for trade and investment. And firms and countries were able to specialize to make contributions in narrow slices of the chain. So in the far, first part of my presentation, and I will go over how this world worked. And then I will show the world we are in today. So we have we come from uh, a long period of sustained international integration. And so if we take global value chains uh, trade as a share of global trade, it has grown consistently since the early 70s, going from 37% in 1970 to 52% uh, at the 10 years ago, at the height of uh, just before the global uh, crisis. And then has been retrenching um, since then. And probably, as Kunal said, uh, with COVID-19, we will see a, a further uh, drop over this. Um, but one important point is before coming to, to what this world looked like is to give some uh, sense of who's in it 
and um, and what we are talking about. And so the first point to remember is that there are no insiders and outsiders to global value chains. It's really a sweeping global phenomenon where all countries participate, but each in different ways. It's a bit like the Anna Karenina uh, book, right? And so we have some countries that are participating mainly by exporting commodities to the rest of the world. Then there are other countries uh, that are participating by predominantly being in limited manufacturing. There are countries that from initial, this breaking into initial uh, labor intensive manufacturing have uh, grown and specialized in advanced manufacturing and services. And finally, there are countries that specialize in innovative activities. And when we talk about global value chains, it's a, fa it's a phenomenon that affects uh, trade, uh, foreign direct investment, firms ownership, uh, uh, innovation, intellectual property, but one easy way to try to measure it is to look at those cases, those actors, where there is a trade in parts and components happening. And so uh, there can be cases where there is this forward participation, where so the commodity producers, they do participate with their exports in the production of others. There are other countries in the middle that import these uh, commodities to export. Um, to other countries that then transform further. So it's this import to export. And then there are countries that are at the end of the chain and that they participate with backward participation, for instance, mainly in the assembly uh, function by importing all inputs. And all, and, and all countries uh, can grow uh, irrelevant of which uh, position they occupy in, in this uh, uh, in this uh, scheme. Um, the other question that I wanted to clarify up front is what we are talking about. Often people say, what, why, why is this global value chain different from trade? Okay, we understand it's import and export, but what is, is there something really special about it? And in the WDR, we discussed uh, with, in the WDR team, we thought a lot about this. And we really think that the two distinguishing features are that we have this hyperscale, hyper specialization, the specialization in very narrow, um, activities. And then on the other, which to me is even more important, is the firm-to-firm -firm relationships that are one, not one-off relationships, like when you go to the market with an, between anonymous actors, but are actually repeated interactions over time and are through marriages, through partnerships. And this have been, in both cases, phenomenon, eh, phenomenal engines of growth because they allowed um, an unprecedented uh, transition transfer of know-how technology, thanks to these long-term um, partnerships, and the hyper-specialization has allowed to participate, to partake in the global economy before learning to do very complex activities and actually uh, learning by doing. And so we then have the drivers that are the traditional drivers of um, of uh, trade, geography, endowments, market size institutions, and we have outcomes in terms of it produces growth and jobs, it leads to poverty reduction, but there are also some implications uh, that make the world less equal uh, and, and, and there are some strains on the environment. But policies can uh, can um, maximize uh, the ability to to leverage growth uh, from global value chains and mitigate the costs. And so uh, the main message I, I want to leave you today is that uh, global value chains have boosted incomes and created better jobs and reduced the poverty across the board. Uh, but as I said, they had this mixed impact on the environment and inequality, and that even after the COVID-19 uh, crisis or during the COVID-19 economic crisis, they can support development, but there are uh, but policy has to play its role. And in particular, developing countries need to keep reforming themselves and industrialized countries need to pursue open and predictable policies. But right now, in many respects, the opposite is happening. So 
the f why uh, global value chains trigger growth? Well, we, we see that firms that both import and export, which is our proxy for global value chain participation, are more productive than one-way traders on, or non-traders. And we tried this with aggregate uh, data, with uh, disaggregated data, and on countries at all levels of development. And here you can see that these bars are the premium on productivity of firms that both export and import the green bars, that export only the blue bars, and that import only the purple bar over firms that neither import nor export. And so you can see that consistently the firms that export and import are the most productive in Ethiopia, in Vietnam, and across the board in developing countries and actually also in developed countries. So I want to now leave you to one question, uh, which uh, we will uh, immediately then uh, look at uh, what's the situation. And the question, it's up here. When do countries see their income grow the most? So when they are commodity driven, when they break into manufacturing for the first time, or when they specialize in advanced services and manufacturing? Great, so um, I share the results, right? Um, so we have that 10% of you uh, said that uh, countries grow the most when they are commodity driven. 29% uh, they said that it is when they break into manufacturing and 61% when they specialize in advanced the countries, uh, in advanced services and manufacturing. Um, I will show you now that in fact, the answer is, let's see if I managed to move on, that countries grow the most in the, when they move from commodities into manufacturing for the first time. There is something special about this transformation. The first transformation is the one that is critical, is because a large mass of population jumps to a much higher um, per capita income. And so we we studied uh, this at the World Bank and we see that after 20 years of jumping into limited manufacturing, countries are 57%, uh, GDP per capita is 57% higher. Um, innovative activities is 32%. Of course, in levels, when countries are in innovative activity, the level of income is much higher, but the qualitative jump is higher when the countries break into uh, simple manufacturing. And that's also, in fact, when uh, countries that are the most supportive of, uh, of globalization. And then um, in, uh, in, in further phases, um, possibly because they see the growth of income slowing down in part, the, there is some skepticism, uh, skepticism that mount in. So, um, so here's the thing. Uh, it's an interesting story with um, with uh, um, with what happens. So basically, countries' incomes become higher, and uh, countries start to import and export. And what happens is that they actually become more capital intensive. So the units of uh, labor per unit of production go down because there is much more technology involved in what countries produce when they get into global value chains. However, because of this capital intensity and this technology, 
these countries are able to produce at a larger scale. Remember in the framework, we said that this scale is one of the two important factors of this phenomenon. And because of the larger scale, it actually becomes employment delivering. So employment grows because of the scale, even though per unit of production, there are less units of employment. And this is an important fact. So it produces employment, but this employment is more capital intensive. And then because it brings uh, more productivity and because it brings more employment, the result is that we also see uh, a, a substantial poverty reduction. And this is from Vietnam, where we looked at the provinces that moved into this import to export are exactly those where uh, the poverty rate decreased the fastest in uh, the 10 years between 2004 and 2014. Um, so you might be asking, okay, that's interesting for the past, but now we have all these technologies that automate production. So there is no, um, there is no, it, it's a, it's a, the, the, the train has passed. Well, that's not the case. We actually looked at uh, those industries that automated the most in the north, and those are precisely the industries that started importing more parts and components from developing countries. So again, the scale effect, the scale story comes up. But there are, of course, also costs to the participation. And so um, there are costs between uh, which companies get the most profit revenue. And this is actually the lead firms in a global value chain, which uh, experience rising profit margins. And suppliers, the, the countries which are mo for the most part in developing countries are often the ones that are being squeezed. We see that, as I said before, the labor share overall declines because there is a, a bigger share of, uh, of this uh, wealth that goes to capital. Uh, and the global value chains the war reward skilled workers against the unskilled. And also, normally, we find that they produce more jobs for women and youth, but these are in the val lower value-added segments of the value chain and in, uh, uh, and in the working fun functions. We see less women in uh, leadership functions in global value chains firms that we see in normal firms. And finally, there is a problem of tax uh, revenue. Rising tax revenue is challenging. Um, and so, in fact, the tax story is the big. Uh, um, I think this is this slide shows the missed promise, the, the failed promise of globalization. In the sense, this uh, this uh, slide shows that while it, since the 1980s, the income of the top one percent uh, and the uh, and the corporate income, the two purple lines, went steadily down. The income of the median worker went up, and this is. This is in 65 economies around the world. And so that's really the missed promise. We generated a system that is way more efficient, produces more wealth, but then because of profit shifting practices, we are unable to, to tax it properly and to redistribute it uh, across the society. And so raising tax revenue is challenging. And if we want uh, uh, trade, I will show at the end that if we want trade to keep being beneficial, um, coming to international agreements on taxation will be, uh, will be key. And this is particularly important for uh, developing countries where um, the revenue loss from profit shifting is higher in percentage of GDP. So that's the, the world that we left. Now the world we are coming in, we live in a world of resurgent techno-nationalism, closing borders and rising protectionism. And this trend has been amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. What does it mean? And here I will just give you the highlights because we would need another 20 minutes presentation to show the results. But so what we see from the early evidence is that first of all, in global value chains, Demand and supply shocks are, uh, are uh, magnified. It's enough for one link not to work to see the reverberations 
uh, spillovers effects across all the supplier network, all the firms involved, all the countries involved. But both the contraction and the negative shock is magnified and also the rebound, the growth is magnified for the very same reason. There are the, both the negative and the positive shocks are magnified in, in, uh, in this uh, world. The direct suppliers and the direct buyers are actually those that are most hardly hit. But as soon as you move to the suppliers of the suppliers or the buyers of the buyers, the negative or the this magnification effect decay very fast. And, um, and also, it's true we saw some shocks due to demand and supply, to which actually the global value chains adjust very well. And I would be happy to to give you examples in the Q&A session. But we also saw that a lot of the problems with the functioning of these global value chains were due to government policies that were rigid and didn't adapt fast enough. And they have generated ripple, ripple effects up and down the value chain. The effects on, on FDI and on trade have been polarized and very different. So we have that most developing countries, most emerging markets suffered enormously, but China gained a lot. Uh, China is, is back on track and developed countries are more or less even in according to the last uh, WIO estimates of the IMF. Small companies are the ones that were the hardest hit. Large corporations, especially if they were uh, data intensive, they thrived. High density face-to-face -face activities suffered. And as I said, activities with a lot of input, digital, uh, digital inputs, uh, they actually thrived. The informal sector suffered a lot. The least protected became even less protected. The unskilled suffered. The young suffered more than the old. Women suffered more than the old. And so in a way, we can say that the poor became poorer with COVID and the rich became richer. And this is really what we need to address. Uh, but we have something at the World Bank, some colleagues did some uh, carry out some firm surveys on large world corporations. And there is one interesting result. While most firms expected, expected some profit loss, the majority of the firms have chosen to maintain their business strategies intact in with respect to input sourcing, diversification of product sites and offshoring, because they say for them, this global structure brings resilience through diversification. And that's exactly what the World Development Report was also uh, saying. So we have, uh, however, uh, with COVID, we are more aware of the dependencies and vulnerabilities in GVCs which have been laid bare, and therefore it creates a new urgency in the search for answers to three sets of questions. One is about uh, where are bottlenecks? So what happens when firms and countries are suddenly cut off from some crucial input? What are these key dimensions of vulnerability? What are the bottlenecks? Another set of questions are whether firms unrelated to global value chains are more adversely impacted by COVID or not, and whether governments should help only domestic firms through the crisis or, or firms that actually help uh, the domestic economy, even if they are from another country. And finally, the third question is whether there is an alternative path to sustain poverty reduction than international integration. And this is the next polling question for you. Is there a, a, an alternative path to sustain poverty uh, reduction other than international trade? The yes, no, or not sure?
So the winner, according to the audience, is uh, no, there is uh, not an alternative uh, path. 75% is convinced that we don't have an alternative path. And that's actually um, also uh, what my colleagues that looked at this uh, question with the, uh, with the data found. So you have basically two engines of sustained poverty reduction. You have to have a large middle class at home, or if you don't have a large and growing and thriving middle class at home, you need to have the international economy, the global demand to, to make up for that. And so we find that all the countries uh, that are uh, above, the me uh, above the median, they might have the possibility with their domestic middle class to eventually consider doing away with trade. But actually, this is not the case for countries that are below the median. Uh, and and, uh, and international trade is needed. And so to conclude, we need to deepen trade, inter traditional trade cooperation, and there are many areas so we need to reduce. Still, there are many areas and many parts of the world where we can do a lot to reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers. We need stronger rules on subsidies and SOEs. We need to combat tariff escalation and reconsider the usefulness of special and differential treatment, but we also need to look beyond trade to keep trade open and beneficial, and in particular to four areas, international cooperation on taxes, international cooperation on competition policy, and in particular competition policy around international data flows and on the environment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Daria. The, your presentation is very interesting, especially as you said, the implication of the pandemic for the world economy is could be quite significant, and especially on the trade-led path for economic development, which has been, as you mentioned, very important for poverty reduction. We'll come back to that in the Q&A on to this uh, question that you raised. Let's move on to the, to the discussant, Professor Selim Ryan. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sen. I must thank you, Inu Voider, for inviting me to this very important event. And, uh, Daria made a very, very comprehensive presentation. So in my short intervention, I'll focus on COVID-19 and international trade in South Asia and some of the very emerging issues and uh, the important issues to consider. So we all know that the COVID-19 has large distressing effects on international trade in South Asian countries. So I am going to present to you some recent data, especially if we look at the exports. Exports saw a large dip in uh, most of the South Asian countries. And I'm here, I'm presenting to you uh, data for the recent data for four South Asian countries. If we look at Bangladesh, you can see that during March and August, export declined by around 30% uh, compared to uh, past year, the same period in the past year. Uh, in India, it has been around 23%. In Pakistan, it has been around 12%. In Sri Lanka, it has been around 26%. There are varying degrees, but actually most of the South Asian countries, they are suffering quite a lot in terms of reaction in export. But we also need to keep in mind that when it comes to trade, it's not only the export, but imports saw a large dip too. And when it comes to integrating with the global economy, uh, actually, if we don't take the mercantilist approach, imports are extremely important because of the industrial development of the South Asian countries. Many of the South Asian countries that rely quite a lot on import of raw materials and capital missionaries. So if we look at the import data, uh, again, during March and uh, August this year, compared to the uh, same period in last year, you can see Bangladesh's import declined by around 26%, India's case uh, to 36%, Pakistan 14%, and Sri Lanka 37%. That means that uh, these countries, they are uh, actually, when it comes to integrating with the global trade, as well as participation in the global value chain, the COVID period has actually made quite a lot uh, distressing effect. Uh, on these economies. Now, uh, if we want to uh, actually, uh, 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 you know, look at the recovery or the issues of recovery, how these countries can actually recover from this uh, COVID-19 situation and uh, made uh, uh, and and make uh, come back to the kind of normal path. So, while we actually talk about the recovery, the recovery of international trade in South Asian countries, they largely depends on the recovery of the global economy, no doubt. But South Asian countries also need to get their domestic fronts right. 
Uh, Daria, in her presentation, talked quite a lot about the global trade, the pattern of global trade, as well as some of the global uh, norms and uh, participation in the global trade, how some of the trade rules can also be very, very important for uh, developing countries. But I, in my short presentation, I want to focus more on the domestic front, because here I find that uh, most of the South Asian countries are actually, they are quite uh, lagging behind. So uh, I thought that there could be three important points to consider for the post-COVID-19 recovery in most of the South Asian countries. First, the benefits of the stimulus packages have remained unequal so far, and which is not conducive for recovery. You know that most of the South Asian countries, they actually announced stimulus packages for, uh, so to support their domestic industries as well as the uh, export industries uh, uh, to recover from the crisis. But uh, the, as we gather more and more evidence now, we are finding that the stimulus package, the distribution of the stimulus, stimulus packages or the kind of way it has been managed, it has not been very uh, equal uh, distribution. And many uh, exporters or many uh, firms which are, which are actually participating in the trade, probably at a limited scale, they are actually left out. So that there are cases where dominant firms, they're actually taking the larger share. So uh, I just want to highlight, share uh, uh, one of the very recent findings from Bangladesh where <clears throat> Sanem conducted a large scale survey uh, on the farms. And we found that the, uh, the dominant farm, you know, dominant sector in Bangladesh, the ready-made garments, they actually got the largest benefit of the stimulus packages, where many other sectors where they have the potentials to uh, actually expand their export or potentials to integrate the global economy, they were left behind. So what is my policy suggestion? The success of the stimulus packages depends on three things. Financing, we all know that financing is an extremely important issue. Most of the South Asian countries, they have low tax GDP ratio, and they are finding it extremely difficult to generate these huge resources to provide the stimulus package. But at the same time, we are finding that the management and the monitoring of the stimulus package has already been kind of problematic. So that's, I think, it's, it's extremely important that uh, while uh, we, uh, these three things are addressed so that the stimulus package can actually benefit uh, most of the uh, you know, affected sectors in the South Asian countries. My second point is that uh, the South Asian countries, their integration with the GVC, global value chain, is limited. And I just want to show you this slide where this is the uh, figure uh, I have taken from the uh, economic complexity uh, you know, index, that database. Uh, where you can see these, these boxes actually show the composition of export of the eight South Asian countries. Uh, you can see there's a high dominance of this green part, which is actually the ready-made garments or textile and clothing. But uh, apart from India, most of the other South Asian countries, they are not actually have very diversified export basket. But even you look at India, uh, you know, uh, there are issues, you know, whether this, even with this diversified export basket, whether they are now in the phase of kind of so-called what in what in Donnie Rodrick's language, the kind of pre-maturity industrialization. So there are issues even for Bangladesh, whether you can see that uh, integration in the global value chain is highly dominated by one particular sector, the ready-made garment sector. So similar stories you will find in other South Asian countries too. Countries too. That means the integration of the global value chain uh, has been limited and there are huge potentials to actually integrate. In, 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 the, in the global value chain too. So what is the policy suggestion? Why this is happening? Uh, in my view, we find that there are uh, you know, uh, serious problems with the trade, industrial, and FDI policies in most of the South Asian countries. Especially, they are not favorable uh, in helping these countries to integrate further with the uh, global value chain. And probably whether, even if you have trade and industrial policy, they are kind of biased towards the dominant sector. So you don't have a kind of industrial policy where other uh, sectors can, can also get the benefit. For example, in Bangladesh, uh, our analysis shows that most of the policies, trade policy, industrial policies, they are actually favoring one particular sector, the ready-made government sector, whereas most of the other exploratory sectors, they are left behind. So we need, a, we need to have substantial reform uh, to address these insufficient trade industrial FDI policies. I know that during the uh, crisis time, probably you know, a reform is not a very popular agenda, but probably during the crisis time, policymakers, they can get the, uh, they, they have the kind of opportunity to get out of their comfort zone and think about this reform uh, very seriously uh, you know, compared to the normal time. My final point is that 
the South Asian countries' trade logistics are not conducive for the effective GBC integration. Here I'm presenting to you the uh, logistic performance index, uh, which is derived from the World Bank's database uh, of, uh, for the latest uh, uh, logistic performance index database of 2018. And here I'm comparing South Asia with East and Southeast Asian countries. And you can see that most of the South Asian countries, probably apart from India, all the South Asian countries, they're seriously lagging behind their, most of their counterparts uh, you know, in uh, our competitor countries in Southeast and Southeast Asian countries. So if you even if you look at the subcomponents of the logistic performance index, most of the South Asian countries, they are seriously lagging behind. So my final policy session is that there is an improvement in trade logistics critical for the post-COVID-19 recovery and effective integration of the global value chain. I'll stop here and I'll be very glad to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, Thank you, Selim. Thank you so much. Um, we have several questions already in the chat. But let me start off with one question of my own, which is to Daria. Daria, do you think that the effect of the pandemic on the world economy situation on trade will be less than what we saw from the global financial crisis? The global financial crisis was a, quite a long, deep effect. While in the case of the pandemic, do you think it'll be relatively short, intense perhaps for this year, maybe early next year, but a quick recovery? What is your sense? I think there are reasons for thinking that will be bigger and reasons for thinking that it will be smaller. Uh, so the a big difference is that um, so far uh, there has not been uh, uh, destruction of assets as to the extent that we saw in the global financial crisis. And we know that a, a financial crisis might come, but we also have a long time to prepare to respond to that. And that's an important factor. On the other hand, we know that uh, until when the health crisis is not over, there won't be an economic recovery. And so this uncertainty, we know from trade that there are permanent effects from the uncertainty. And so it will be really linked to that. But one important point is really, I think one factor is really this huge polarization. And so, I think, again, it will depend on policy, whether it will be bigger or smaller, because if a policy embraces sustainability and uh, inclusiveness, uh, we will maybe even have helped the transition towards uh, the data economy that was going to happen, and we have accelerated, and we will end up with a boost in productivity. But if we do not embrace uh, uh, this inclusive, a, a different way of doing policy, then we will have strains and even social conflict for a long time. And the collaboration on the vaccines and the collaboration on the way we will distribute the vaccines will be, I think, a test on what the new globalization will look like. Thank you, Daria. Now, let me uh, also now ask some questions from the chat that we have received. So the first question is from Vidya Mani. She asked the following question to, uh, this is for Daria. Um, the supply chain bullwhip effect would suggest that the deeper tier suppliers will suffer far more than downstream players. That is volatility effects get magnified as you go further up the supply chain. Can you talk about the economic effects from the COVID-19? Would it exacerbate this particular effect, having a stronger effect on deeper tier suppliers rather than downstream players? What would be your answer to this question? So this is something that people are still looking at. Uh, there are, uh, theoretically can be, can go both ways and depends on how specialized these suppliers are. Uh, from past shocks like the tsunami in, uh, in, in Japan, the triple shock of tsunami, earthquake and nuclear meltdown in Japan, we know that as soon as you move out of the immediate suppliers and buyers, actually, it's true there might be more volatility, but these firms are not totally dependent on, on, on the firm that was affected by the shock. And so diversification helps. So it's an empirical matter ultimately, but I have reasons to believe that diversification helps. Thank you very much, Daria. I have a question from a colleague of ours, Ricardo Santos, two questions actually. Ricardo, I've allowed you to speak if you want to ask your question live. Uh, hello, uh, thank you Kunal and um, thank you Daria uh, for the very thought provoking and Salim also for the very 
thought-provoking presentations. I I have two different questions, so I probably I'll start with I'll probably read both of them, but they are quite different. So the first one is so arguably poverty reduction, such, such as was the case in Vietnam, happens uh, through increased per capita consumption. So through through this the switch, uh, the shift in occupation. Arguably also, this is not a, sim a simple process. It's actually rather complex. For instance, shifts from agriculture to labor intensive manufacturers are not the same as shifts from agriculture to extractives or to com com capital intensive manufacturers, even within global value chains. Are you able to peek into the labor contribution and the employment black box and assure us that the global value chains are actually promoting a structural transformation towards first stage manufacturing in most cases, or is Vietnam the last example of an old loss dynamic? So that would be a first question. The second is more related to COVID itself. So COVID seems to have strengthened uh, um, the insourcing narrative and somehow the threat of divesting from offshoring of some relatively labor intensive global value chain links and investment on automated insured links that replace those. Is this a credible threat, a visible trend? And if so, what challenges does this bring to poverty and inequality reduction? Thanks, Ricardo. So these are really two great questions. And I think actually both uh, Daria and, and Selim can take a stab at answering these questions. Daria, you want to go first? Um, I mean, given that I spoke so much, let's have, uh, if, if I don't want to throw Selim under the bus, but Selim, if you want to go first, I'm also happy. Uh, no, uh, no, you're, you're, you decide. Ahead. No, no worries, okay. please go ahead. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so let me uh, start with the with the first one. So uh, indeed, Vietnam uh, it looks like has been uh, really good at managing this transition. Um, so what we looked is that actually Ethiopia is following a similar path. Uh, I mean, when we looked at we, we we picked the countries at different levels of transition, and we saw that actually the the, there is uh, other countries that are following the same path. And uh, I do really think that the reason is uh, both this ability to build scale and this firm to firm relationship. It's true that it's more complex activities, but you are not doing them alone. You are actually embedded into uh, in, in, and you benefit of uh, of the know-how and the knowledge of firms that are uh, that are used to this uh, handling of complex uh, complex activities. So in a way, it's like if uh, this firm-to-firm -firm relationships allow to import institutions and and to allow the domestic producers to leverage us on these foreign institutions uh, to learn about these transitions. So we, we, we see that uh, in motion um, in the countries in Africa as well, manufacturing, uh, it's Ethiopia, but we have, uh, I don't know, other cases, uh, Kenya more on the services sector, um, and both for regional value chains, for instance, South Africa, than with global value chains. Uh, on the COVID, the, the narrative of, of uh, doing away with offshoring and uh, and um, and uh, technology, I think these are two things that are happening. So I think the smaller firms, the firms that have uh, their demand more localized domestically or within the macro region, we see that they are either reinsuring or nearshoring. Um, but the purely global companies, as I said, the survey from my colleagues seems to say that they have no intention to change their uh, global diversification strategies. Automation is a different story. It's true that this crisis is automating uh, production everywhere. Uh, but what we saw when we looked at that uh, in the WDR is that actually automation of production, because it delivers this scale economies, is also generating income and demand effects. And so there is uh, 
less demand for that particular item that is maybe automated, but there is much more demanded for a wider variety of parts and components. Or for instance, we've showed the case of uh, uh, hearing aids that became completely 3D printed. Well, they are, they are 3D printed, but they're not 3D printed at home or in the small shop, uh, uh, I don't know, in the rich country, they are still 3D printed in massive um, factories in developing countries and then um, exported, traded. So there are more jobs and more trade, but uh, indeed uh, for the skilled workers and, and, and for the machines together. And the more complex economy that it generates, generates more jobs, but in more varied sectors. So at the extensive margin, if you look at the intensive margin, you will only see the negative effects. Thanks, Daria. So Selim, I want to ask this question in particular in relation to Bangladesh, because Bangladesh, more than any other country in South Asia, has really taken advantage of labor-intensive GVCs, particularly through apparel. So first of all, first question is that, do you think that has led to significant poverty reduction? So is there a kind of close, close issue we see with labor-intensive GVCs in apparel and poverty reduction? And secondly, what is the threat of outsourcing for Bangladesh, particularly on the apparel sector, that we see now, or post-COVID? Uh, uh, definitely, the ready-made garment sector in Bangladesh, you are very much right that actually it has, to, it has contributed to a reduction in poverty uh, over the past few decades. And that has been kind of, uh, in through different empirical studies, it has been shown uh, quite, uh, it has been quite straightforward, especially it has also contributed to women empowerment. But I also agree with Daria in her presentation, she made that probably we are at a, we are at a very lower end of the value chain, uh, global value chain where you have little bargaining power uh, so that uh, even if you have uh, employment generation, reduction in poverty, but uh, we have seen in decades over decades, the wage in the ready-made garment sector did not improve much and also the working condition, there are serious issues. Uh, but your point, uh, the second point is that whether the COVID-19 situation, what we are observing. I wanted to highlight one particular point is that you remember that uh, infamous Rana Plaza event in 2013, where the big building collapsed, the factory collapsed. And after that, over the last uh, six, seven years, there has been a growing tendency of uh, automation in the ready-made garment sector, labor replacing uh, you know, technology. And uh, during this COVID, uh, the fear might be that, you know, uh, th this can also be speed up, you know, this uh, kind of uh, automation, especially to minimize the human interaction and also to gain the more productivity. Uh, or, you know, so probably that can also happen. And in the recent time, what we are observing, there have been some cases that the ready-made garment sector, because of this COVID situation, a cancellation of orders and uh, uh, reduced demand in the North American European uh, Union, especially these two major export destinations, uh, this sector is actually under pressure. And uh, because of the second wave, which is you know, forthcoming, and uh, which is also already there in many of these European countries, there is a fear that the sector will be actually in, will be in, under serious pressure. So all these things are actually in a very complex situation where the investors of the firms, actually the, we have conducted a big survey through, through Sanem, and they have found that they are actually not in a very much in a confident situation and what is going to happen in the next uh, three or four months in the ready garment sector to devise their strategy. Uh, so I think this will be very, very important in the coming days. Over to you, Professor Sam. Thanks, uh, thanks, Salim. Uh, I have now two questions from Professor Andy Sumner. Andy, I'm, I've given you permission to speak, so you've been unmuted. You want to ask your questions live to, to Daria and Salim? Yeah, sure. Okay. <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yes, yes we can. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's an amazing moment where people have, have given you the, uh, the, the unmute um, <clears throat> uh, on, in this Zoom world we now live in. Um, so I, I, I have, um, well, there's, that, there's actually, three questions and I don't want to take too much time so I'll run through them relatively quickly. In a way they, they relate to thinking about um, issues about global production and global inequality. Uh, in fact, since I've started speaking, someone started drilling the road outside. Um, <clears throat> so if you think about global inequality as having two components, the within country component and the between country component, clearly GVCs, uh, uh, the strength of GVCs potentially is around the reducing the uh, between country inequality seen as what, what you've said and what is well known GVCs may well uh, have a strong association with uh, rising within country inequality. So I think you know, the three questions I, I had were really, I mean, first of all, 
I wondered what you made of the, the kind of mixed blessings thesis of Marcel Timmer uh, in the recent Journal of Development Studies paper that the productivity gains are clear enough, um, but the formal sector employment gains are much less clear when he looked at the data. And they also suggested a, a non-linear relationship, a non-linear relationship where the benefits are really at when, when countries join global value chains and then these benefits diminish over time as countries head towards middle income productivity levels. Then the second question is really the, 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 the very well-known uh, Richard Baldwin thesis about COVID-19 and tradable services. Uh, do you think we're going to see this tradable services revolution uh, telemigrating, as he calls it, and how does that fit with GBCs? And then the final question is more philosophical. Um, does it matter that economic development is no longer about deep industrialization? It's no longer about building industries. It's about doing tasks and creating some value added and jobs. I mean, does that leave developing countries vulnerable when, it com when companies switch suppliers? And I mean, how should countries deal with that? And have we given up on the on the big ideas about economic development being an economic transformation and, and deep industrialization? Thank you. Uh, Daria, these are really uh, great questions. Do you want to give, um, answer yeah, them? Yeah, I'll try to be very short um, uh, in the interest of, of time. So um, uh, on the Timmer uh, and PAL hypothesis, so that's a bit what I've showed, right? That uh, we have, uh, we have uh, more income creation, but it's uh, more capital intensive activities. And so the, the units of labor um, that go into one unit of production diminish and the, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and clearly, so you, you will not ex see a one-to-one -one increase in employment with an increase in growth, but it's really this scale effect that gives you the positive uh, uh, labor um, effect. And then uh, it does, you have to have policy assisting this uh, process of transformation. So it cannot be left in the, in the you know, in, in the, private hands only you need to assist this profit of transform uh, this process of transformation and the same to make sure that it transfer into formal jobs but we also know from any study of development that informal jobs are most prevalent into the poorer countries because basically people move to formal jobs because there is more security as soon as they can so policy has to do its part to help this process, but but we need to to recognize that there is growth coming, and then the question is how you distribute and use it in uh, gainful ways. Which also brings me to the last question you have on the deep industrialization versus thin shallow industrialization. It's so this is like an opportunity, like it's a lack of devaluation. Devaluation can be good if you do something with that moment of respite that you have, or can be bad if you just uh, don't do anything with it. And so, and you, you, you. The idea is not that you just stay into this uh, specialized uh, activities and you do not achieve any more uh, deep industrialization. You still have to have uh, a program, which is actually what Vietnam is doing, anchored on, you know, empowering your human capital, building infrastructure, and making your economy more complex. And so that's an entry point. But then. Ultimately, you need to achieve structural transformation the way, frankly, most of the Asian, uh, East Asian countries did, right? So, and the third one on uh, Richard Baldwin, which is my PhD supervisor, by the way, story on telemigrants, I, I'm, I totally, actually, I helped him uh, correct the draft of that book. So, uh, you know, you open uh, an open door, basically. I, I agree. Uh, I think we are experiencing a transformation in uh, towards digital services. And I will tell you more that this, uh, this use of data intensive services we are having, it will uh, survive the COVID crisis because we are investing into learning about using these technologies. And so those are fixed costs. And so there will be hysteresis. So yes, I think we will see a new wave, a reglobalization driven by data intensive services. Thank you, Daria. Uh, I have a question from Vidya Mani. I'm, not just, I'm gonna see, but Vidya, I want to ask you a question 
live can i can unmute you go ahead thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to ask and um, daria and selim thank you for a wonderful presentation um the question i had was in some of the policy announcements that you're seeing post covid 19 there seems to be a lot more focus on policies that should encourage domestic production domestic consumption um little pull away from the global value chains it, i i i don't i don't see that possible but there seems to be a focus on that how well do you think are the countries placed with respect to their domestic or regional value chains as opposed to the global value chains or do you see that making any impact going forward so let me you want to try do you want to answer this question uh, yes i i can try uh, yes thank you thank you vida for very very interesting question i think this is a, a challenge uh, maybe the not only the south asian countries many developing countries they are also facing if i give you the uh, you know the kind of uh, ex experience from bangladesh uh, you are right there are many policies and many programs now during this covid 19 especially through the stimulus packages fiscal support monetary kind of support uh, through uh, monetary policies and there are many kind of supporting uh, uh, programs as well but uh, uh, they are though they are targeting both the export oriented sectors as well as the domestic uh, you know sectors uh but we are seeing that very interestingly that the export oriented sector especially those sectors which are very efficient in handling or having uh, many uh, kind of uh, they they have very strong lobbying power they uh, are actually getting the most benefit uh, most of the benefit uh, or which have been announced so far uh, the policies so but in the at the domestic front the large especially if i want to highlight the we, we haven't talked about the smes the role of smes today uh, especially how they are also in, integrated the global value chain either directly or indirectly uh, they have very important role in the domestic value chain as well as in the global value chain many of the export oriented sectors they have actually backward linkages with, with many of these smes but when it comes to smes i think they are facing a lot of challenges now uh to get the benefit out of this uh, announced packages and uh, just to give you one example uh, uh so far the official statistics show that only 25% of the announced stimulus packages have been disbursed for the smes so uh when it comes to that that's why i'm saying that when it comes to announcement probably there are kind of uh, announcement or uh, for supporting policies for uh domestic oriented uh, domestic oriented sectors as well as the export oriented sectors but when it comes to getting the benefit out of it i think the most more efficient firms who are actually capable of handling many of these things uh, uh, and there you can bring in all these political economy issues institutional issues they are actually getting the benefit out of it so i can see that's why i tried to mention the point that the distribution of the stimulus packages or the benefit of the stimulus packages have been have remained unequal in most of these countries thanks selim i have some question from shawn gray and i'm going to also shawn i'm going to allow to i'm going to unmute you if you want to want to ask your question live go ahead um <clears throat> yeah thank you uh, thank you punada um wonderful presentation daria um i hope you can hear me yeah, yeah. very well thanks yes. yeah, yeah. um um so um what i would uh, the you've pointed out that the pandemic has actually uh, been quite unequal in terms of the effect it has had on small versus large firms uh, and many other kind of inequalizing effects so what would be in your opinion the policies that countries can undertake to overcome some of these uh, challenges and integrate better into global value chains yeah thanks um so i think that uh, we need to look at growth and sustainability and inclusiveness as part of the same framework i think we are used in the past to think about growth and then we say when we'll be rich we'll worry about sustainability inclusiveness and i think we do not have time for that anymore 
because social tensions will kick in and simply growth will anyway be stifled. So we need to have the two together. And so I think we need, I mean, the big problem of this crisis is also, we haven't talked about it at all, but there is a big elephant in the room. We are generating a lot of debt. Every country is getting hugely indebted. We need the big policies with big multipliers, and those are digital and environment. And so, uh, inclusiveness, the digital and environment have to be the areas where we invest uh, to make basically, um, you know, as a guiding principle for the policies that we are doing forward, we are, we are having going forward. Thanks, Daria. And just one last question I have is for Selim. Uh, Selim, what do you think about the RCEP, which was very recently signed? This very large trade agreement for GVC trade in Asia and particularly South Asia. Do you see a lot of possibilities here, particularly for Bangladesh or maybe other South Asian countries? Uh, you are very much right that RCP probably this is one of the biggest events you know in, uh, in international trade in recent time, especially uh, after the deadlock in the WTO negotiation and uh, many of the uh, you know the trade wars we have witnessed in recent years. So I think uh, definitely South Asian countries they have. Uh, you know, many things actually they need to say, consider it seriously about how they can actually integrate with the, uh, when you talk about the larger in Asian integration, an RCAP can be a step towards that larger integration. Uh, we all know that China is the largest trading partner for most of the South Asian countries. And uh, though despite that India and China, we have, uh, we, we have seen some tensions. I think it is kind of uh, uh, agreed or kind of a general perception uh, among other South Asian countries that integration with China can really help, not only through trade, but also through FDI. So I think uh, I can see a very positive vibe, especially immediately after the RCP was signed, there were programs organized by Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bangladesh uh, where, uh, to how we can, Bangladesh can actually integrate with the RCP. So I, I, I can see that there, is a, there will be a growing demand for a larger integration. Uh, with the, the with this initiative from Bangladesh and from other South Asian countries as well. Thank you, Selim. We are out of time, and so I want to now end the webinar. I want to say that I'm somebody who always believed that globalization is very important with all its problems. Globalization has caused a lot of challenges for poverty reduction. We know that from the, the East Asian experience. And certainly, I, I hope that the pandemic and what we've seen in the last few years, post-2008, the temporary aberration, and we can go back to what Daria called reglobalization, which would be very wonderful. Thank you so much, Daria and Selim, for your presentations and very, very thoughtful responses to the many questions we had today. Thank you, and thanks to everyone who participated, and thanks especially those who asked the questions today. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye bye.